Let's start with the financial stuff in the beginning. While going shopping on a Saturday, I felt some pains around my body, a little bit of dizziness even. And unfortunately, when those pains or that dizziness are in certain regions of my body, the fact that I've had heart disease in my past means that I have to track it down. So, after the symptoms didn't quite go away fast enough, I went to my preferred hospital, checked myself into the emergency room, and then they did a battery of tests on me. Checking for a secretion my heart will do if it's having a heart attack or is in distress, going through all of the different viruses and possible blood issues that I might be having, and ultimately not finding anything. But they decided to do a nuclear stress test anyway. This is where you're put on a treadmill and then do imaging to find out if there are any blockages on your heart. Unfortunately, the lab wasn't open until that Monday, so they kept me under observation for about 36 hours, during which I lay in bed, napped a lot, played way too many TikTok videos, and generally waited until my moment came. I'd run a nuclear stress test before, and so it wasn't that surprising. And then after looking at the results, they gave me a clean bill of health, giving me all of my test results, including all of the blood work they had done, and sending me on my way. A couple weeks later, a bill arrived. Now, in the old days, I had a lot of problems with medical bills, either lacking insurance or not understanding what I was paying for. But since joining the archive, I've had really good health insurance, and every time any opportunity has come to increase it, I've taken it. So those 36 hours, roughly, cost $26,000, which was then knocked down by my insurance company to $6,809, and then finally, I was on the hook for 250 That's the reality of where I am now. With good insurance and focusing on taking care of myself, I will occasionally have to put this money out. But $250, to be 100% sure that I'm not going through something terrible, is ultimately pretty valuable, even if it cost me a day and a half to find it out. Anyway, I acquired a lot of Computer Shopper. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Computer Shopper was the backbone the Bible, the central information for gray market and above market computer products, especially in the 1980s until falling by the wayside in the face of internet-connected warehouses and ultimately places like Newegg, Amazon, and so on. It was an enormous magazine, hundreds of pages and each page massive, much larger than 8.5 by 11 inches. It was, in so many ways, a massive chapbook, a huge Bible of what was going on in terms of what parts were available, what kind of machines and configurations a user could get, and most importantly, where the prices were standing, fluctuating for floppy disks, RAM chips, motherboards, wires, connectors. It was all in there, in hundreds and hundreds of pages every month. For somebody who lived through Computer Shopper's heyday, this was a work-stopping moment every month when it arrived. You would find out about incredible deals or programs and processors that were coming onto the market, You were able to see who was selling what and what was popular and what was falling off the radar and becoming cheaper and cheaper. And if you were following behind the leading edge, it was your opportunity to clean up. Uh, Sure, Computer Shopper had articles. It had a smattering of review and overview of various products. 
but you came to Computer Shopper for the ads. It was 90% ads. And you would think, in the modern era, where everything has been scanned, everything has been gone over, we would have a situation where there would be all of these amazing scans of Computer Shopper. But there aren't. There's almost none. A few hardy souls have scanned a few pages out of some issues. Some of the later, smaller issues have been scanned okay, pretty well. But those beautiful, massive, original, gangster, monster issues have eluded us. And this is a shame, because not only are the ads informative and allowing us informative semantic data about the computer industry, Computer Shopper was one of the largest, most dependable bulletin board lists that you would ever encounter. They'd print everything. Sometimes a bulletin board system would disappear, and it would stay on Computer Shopper for a bit too long. But in general, if you had a bulletin board system, you let Computer Shopper know about it. As somebody who has an interest in bulletin board listings, it's always been a little bit outside of my realm, a white whale that I'm trying to catch to have all of those wonderful numbers within my grasp. I would adore the ability to go through those pages virtually. But in a huge realm of many projects, and unable to find anybody who wanted to take this on, Computer Shopper stayed in the darkness. All that changed recently when somebody mentioned to me that there was an eBay sale of Computer Shoppers. The only problem was they were way too expensive. Charging over $50 an issue and requiring thousands of dollars to get your hands on them. But it reminded me how critical these documents were. So I started looking through other eBay listings, and I found one. I found somebody who had a little over 200 issues throughout the heyday of Computer Shopper. And I reached out to the world and made a commitment if you buy this for me, I will scan them. Four hours later, I was the owner of over 200 issues of Computer Shopper. It had begun. Computer Shopper was now not just part of a possible to-do list, but a concrete one. A volunteer in the local area has begun packing them up after picking them up from the original owner, and soon they'll be arriving. This brings a whole host of issues now that Computer Shopper going digital is on my to-do list. The most pressing concern, the most pressing issue, and the one that may stir up the most controversy, is that I'm going to have to debine these. I'm going to have to turn them into stacks of paper. There's just no way around it. The design of the pages, their size, the fact that I want to scan them without clever optical trickery or shoving them into a machine I can't afford means it's time, for the first time for me, to pull a magazine apart to save it. We have had years, decades, for those computer shopper scans to arrive done a regular way, done without carefully removing each page from the binding. And it's never arrived. My goal, as lofty as it is, is to be not only the first, but the last possible scan of Computer Shopper. To scan it at ludicrous resolutions, to be able to ensure that it has a place in the future where we don't look back on it miserable, at how janky it looks, where you notice every single detail and every piece of it can be used later for study, for reproducing, for being able to do research easily using optical character recognition and all the other technology that we're going to have. 
I expect some pushback, some anger. But this is a very, very special case. Computer shoppers' importance, combined with the fact that nobody has been able to do this work, lays at my feet, taking that mantle. The good news, though, is that what will come of this project is a truly special set of thousands of pages of legitimate computer history that will expand far beyond a few minor niche interests and go fully into the general sphere of cultural interest. I will ensure it gets out there far and wide and that it reaches as many people who will find in it all sorts of artistic, numerical, economic, and societal information as it has to give. The fact that I now wait for these packages to arrive, to know that their destiny is to finally bring them online, and most importantly to me, the ability to scan all of these bulletin board system listings and gather a truly comprehensive idea of what bulletin boards were like in the 1980s, it's a personal happiness. It's a check mark off a bucket list. It's a truly wonderful moment. And none of it, none of it could have happened without dozens of people contributing funds to make it happen. I, I just don't have the ability to throw money in one direction or another just because I'm worried about its longevity. I have to. I have learned to reach out, to express to people what I want to do, what the project is about, and hope that people will step forward and make it happen. That happened here, and it's now one of my most important projects to make sure that their trust is placed properly. And if you're somebody who didn't know what Computer Shopper was, well, maybe this is a really good time to clear out some disk space, because a truly inspiring amount of 1980s and 1990s computer history is about to be scanned. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Craig Talbert, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, Martin, Sembiance, Tiggs, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere, who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. There aren't many other magazines that haven't in some way found themselves digital. The ability to turn Computer Shopper into something digital will require a special scanner, one that isn't scared by the massive size of these pages. I think it's a great investment. And I want to say, it's always been my philosophy, that I don't like doing large amounts of work and waiting for a moment to release them, even if it takes a long time. When I finish issues, they will go up. When I scan pages, I will talk about them. I think transparency is the key to something like this being successful and finding value, improvement, and response to be the watchwords of what's going on. And as for debinding, as for pulling them apart, I honestly say I don't see any other option and I hope I never have to do it again. <laughs>